So welcome everybody to this week's message from Sudbury Baptist Church. It's great to be back. Um, we've had a bit of a break lately from these online talks. There's been um, services happening at Sudbury Baptist Church, um, which have just been a little bit too difficult to record online. We've had a baptism service, which was incredible. We've also had a, a family service and um, I was away for one week. Um, so we've had a bit of a break. Um, but today we're back with another series, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, just a little note for the future too. Um, from June all the way through to August, I'm on sabbatical, which means that I won't be recording any sermons online. However, um, services obviously continue at Sudbury Baptist Church, um, but online content will be back in September. So we're going to have a bit of a break um, for three months, um, but the services, the sermons um, that I preach at church will be back online in September. But today um, I'd like to introduce you to a new series which is going to take us up all the way through to the end of May. And I've called it Baptist Groundbreakers. Over the next few weeks, we're going to draw some inspiration from some of our forebears. I've called the series Baptist Groundbreakers because God has used people in our shared history, in our past, um, to shape who we are today. They've broken the ground for us. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangled and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that's what these people in our past did. They followed the pioneer Jesus. We still follow the pioneer Jesus Christ, don't we? But we can learn from past examples and our shared history and be inspired and encouraged to follow Jesus in our own times. Today I'd like to introduce you to two men, one man called John Smythe and another man called Thomas Helwys and the time is the late 1500s, early 1600s. What was going back, what was going on back in the world then? Well, there was a change of monarch. The long-standing Queen Elizabeth I, who had brought a measure of stability and wealth and peace to the nation because of her long reign, had died in 1603 to be replaced by James VI of Scotland and I of England. So these were tumultuous times, a change of leadership and authority in the nation. The plague had spread across England in the same year. This is the era of Guy Fawkes, 1605. It was just a few decades before the English Civil War and the Great Fire of London. And this was also the latter stages of the Reformation where the Christian church across Europe had been radically shaken to the core. There are some similarities, aren't there, with that time and this time. Wars, pandemics, changes of leadership, all the issues that were around then still manifest themselves today. But back then, this could um, be a really grim, gruelling and uncertain, tempestuous time, like it is in many parts of the world today. Was God at work all that time ago? Did the same Holy Spirit make, uh, move people's hearts into action and faith? The answer, of course, is yes, of course. And if he moved and worked back then, then he surely moves and works now, today, with us. So let's start with this man called John Smythe. He was born in 1570, so the latter part of the 1500s. And by the age of 16, he was a student at Cambridge University. In those days, universities were incredibly religious and part of the church, 
part of the established established church and John Smythe ended up being ordained and elected as a fellow of the university. He must have been a clever chap. However, even though the university was part of the church, it didn't stop it being a hotbed for radical thinking and debate. And John Smythe was certainly a radical thinker. He was probably schooled by radical Puritan thinkers who argued for a purer religion than the one that was on offer. And by the time he was ordained, he already had some radical views for his day. These were developing into ideas about the Bible that directly contradicted and opposed the law of the Church of England at the time. It's hard for us to imagine that the Church of England had so much thwack, isn't it? But we need to remember that there was no difference back then between church and state. No separation between religion and everyday life. So what the church said and how to worship was the law of the land. So what do you do if you read the Bible and you are convinced that the law of the church at the time contradicts the Bible? And this is precisely the place that John Smythe eventually found himself in. Romans 12, 1 to 2 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Then it goes on to say, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. It's so easy, isn't it, to be conformed to the dominant culture around us? What would it look like today if you and I lived radically? <laughs> Are there things in our culture that, if we're honest, we need to take a stand against? Do we read the Bible and absorb its teaching for ourselves? John Smythe soon became an all-out rebel. <laughs> well, that's how he was seen by the establishment anyway. And he was soon stripped of his office. He moved to the village of Gainsborough and there pastored other people who were like-minded. It's really important to remember that then England was completely ruled by the monarch what he thought and said was taken as what God himself thought and said. James I had said at the time of anyone who did not conform to the beliefs and practices of the Church of England, he said, I will make them conform themselves or I will have them out of the land. So that gives you a taste, doesn't it, for the culture at the time. England was a dangerous place for anyone who thought or believed anything different to the established order. So what was it that John Smythe, after studying the scriptures in depth at university, had come to believe and hold on to as true? I'm going to tell you, but you probably won't think it's that radical, but back, for the back in the day, it really was. The first thing that he opposed was any sort of hierarchy. He wanted to create a church as the one described in the book of Acts, where everyone shared everything and were all of one mind. He rebelled against the Anglicanism of the day that saw bishops rule at the top, clergy in the middle and laity at the bottom. And most of all, he saw this as going against the truth that was in scripture. During the Reformation and its fire um, had began to dwindle at this point in history, actually, but its influences lived on. The cry of the revolutionists had been sola scriptura, only scripture. And this was John Smythe's starting point in everything. He could not see any justification for the Anglicanism of the day with its hierarchy in the pages of the Bible. This led on to how people 
became part of the church. He started to think about that. Many people across Europe who had protested against the Roman church had been practising believers baptism for a few decades at this point. Some of them paying the ultimate price for their rebellion. <laughs> One cruel way to punish those who had rebelled against the teaching of the Roman church was to tie them to a chair and throw them into the river. Almost saying, well, if you want a baptism by immersion, you can have it. And of course, they drowned. John Smythe also could see in scripture that baptism was for those who believed. And if you are baptised when you're a baby, how can you make that personal and life-changing decision yourself? He wrote in 1609, Baptism is not washing with water, but it is the baptism of the spirit, the confession of the mouth and the washing of the, with water. How then can any man without great folly wash with water, which is the least and last of baptism? Basically, he's saying that the genuine public confession of faith and being filled with the Holy Spirit is an important, if not so more important, um, part of baptism than just being washed with water. It was amazing a few weeks ago to witness four baptisms at Sudbury Baptist Church on Easter Day. And we saw that each person went through the waters of baptism. They were immersed under water and came back up again. But what came first was their testimony, their public confession with their own mouths of their faith in Jesus Christ. And once they confessed their faith out of a personal belief, they were led through the water and then we laid hands on them and asked God to fill them with the Holy Spirit. So there were three parts, one fluid movement, moving one onto the next. And this is what John Smythe believed and fought for as he read it in the scriptures. So famously and controversially, John Smythe baptised himself in front of his congregation and began then to baptise them. For these beliefs and for teaching them to others, uh, John Smythe was persecuted and exiled, like many people who believed the same. And one of these people in John Smythe's congregation was a man called Thomas Helwis. And this is the next guy that I want to tell you about today. Thomas Helwis was someone in John Smythe's congregation and was influential in helping the whole congregation get out of England and settle in Amsterdam, where the laws were a lot more liberal and freer. Helwis was considerably wealthy and is likely to have used his money to serve the congregation in this way. Can you imagine banding together as a church family, <laughs> reconciling to, uh, sorry, relocating to a different country, reconciling our differences um, imagine the level of fellowship that would be required. Imagine the art of being able to bear with one another and to live with one another. Perhaps in all this adversity, the vision of the church in Acts that John Smythe so longed for, where the church lived much the same way, was realised. In what ways does it mean for us today to be faithful to one another at church in our own time and in our own way and in our own lives? What does it mean to truly love one another today for us at Sudbury Baptist Church? So once the congregation had arrived in Amsterdam, which was a refuge in those days for freer thinkers and those escaping persecution, they all lived in a bakehouse together, belonging to a Christian man called Jan Munter. And there they were free to practice worship, led only by their consciences and their reading of scripture. Yet, this time was also incredibly testing for them. Remember I told you about the plague, the plague hit them and they were also overcrowded. 
What made this time harder was the fact that Thomas Helwys and John Smythe began to differ in what they believed, causing turbulence in the congregation. Up until this point, Thomas Helwys had supported John Smythe, had followed him. But John Smythe was becoming more and more separatist. Smythe didn't agree that an English translation of the Bible should exist and believed that church, in order to be authentic and completely separate from the state, needed to retreat into the fringes of society. This meant disassociating with the problems and pains of the world around them. Thomas Helwys, on the other hand, didn't believe this and saw things quite differently. He believed that the church should be a part of the cure, not the disease, that we shouldn't retreat. Even though we're not part of the state, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't serve our society and the culture around us and be an influence of good and God's plans in his world. John Smythe eventually left and joined another group of Christians in Amsterdam called the Mennonites, and they were strictly Puritan and separatist and retreated to the fringes of society. He almost left that congregation in the lurch. And the relationship that had developed between John Smythe and Thomas Helwys, through immense difficulty and trial, um, was torn apart. Thomas Helwys felt betrayed by John Smythe. And in our story today, this is the real tragic moment. Helwys wrote about John Smythe. He said, Have we not neglected ourselves, our children and our wives, and all we had and respected him? talking about John Smythe. All our love was too little for him and not worthy of him. So there was great pain there in that relationship. Thomas Helwys, though, courageously led the congregation then back to England from Amsterdam. And this is where it gets exciting and most defining for us. They sailed back to London and set up what is considered to be the first Baptist church on English soil in 1613. And they settled in London in a place called Spitalfields, preaching on the streets and growing the church. Whilst Thomas Helwys had been living in the freedom of Amsterdam, he had written a book called A Short Declaration of the Mystery of Iniquity. It's a very odd title and not very catchy, to be honest. But basically, it was a biblical claim, a tract for religious freedom, published in English, saying that people should be able to worship God freely in their own way. Because it was published in English and because it said this message, it would certainly get him in trouble back in England, where it was still expected that people worshipped in the way that the Church of England decreed. Helwys believed that the church must bear witness to the truth of scripture, whatever the cost. And Helwys too, um, when he read scripture, felt and saw that the way that the Church of England at the time, the Anglicanism at the time, contradicted what was in scripture. He believed that each person should be free to bear witness to what they read in the pages of scripture and not be forced to worship in a way by somebody else. So most courageously, when he returned to England, he sent a copy of this tract, this book with this strange title, to King James I. This man had guts. May I remind you that at this point in history, the civil war hadn't happened. Parliament had not been formed in the way it is formed today. It was existed almost as a council for the king. Because still what the king thought and said was taken as what God thought and said. He was very much in control and in charge and going against him would mean certain imprisonment and likely death. 
Yet so strong was Thomas Helwes's conviction, he signed a copy of this tract, this book, put his name on it, this book about religious liberty, and wrote a message to the king on the front page. And this is what he wrote. He said, hear, O king, and despise not the counsel of the poor. The king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he hath no power over the immortal souls of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them and to set spiritual lords over them. In his book, he went on to say that for men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it, neither may the king be judged between God and man. Let them be heretics, Turks, Jews, or whatsoever it appertains, not to the earthly power to punish them in the least measure. This is made evident to our Lord the King by the scriptures. You see, everything that he based his beliefs and actions on was what he read in the scriptures. Wow, what bravery, what courage, what guts. For this though, Thomas Helwish was arrested and taken to Newgate Prison. Nobody knows what happened to him after that, but it's likely that he died in prison by 1616. Thomas Helwes died in defence of religious liberty here in England. With all his might and energy, he implored people to put their trust in Christ as the one and only way to be saved. He put all his trust in the Christian scriptures, but he passionately believed that people, having heard the gospel for themselves, had to choose for themselves and therefore worship in their own way. And that other people should not force others to worship in their way. And whatever people chose, it is not us or the king or the state who would judge them, but God alone. In a world where the Church of England prescribed how everyone must worship, John and Thomas were both Baptist groundbreakers, weren't they? And we sit here today enjoying the liberty to worship that they fought for. It's incredibly inspiring, isn't it, to know we have this as part of our identity. As Baptist Christians here in England and we are now able to worship in freedom because of people like them who gave everything, who followed their consciences and followed Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So the challenge for us then, for you and for me, is this. Are we making the most of that liberty? Do we come and worship freely and joyfully because we know that we can? Or do we see it as a chore because we think we have to? Do we share the gospel with those that we meet, the good news about Jesus, the love that he has for every single man, woman and child, knowing that we are completely free to do so? Do we make the most of these opportunities today? in our lives and what does it mean today for you and I to love each other deeply as Sudbury Baptist Church but also to live radically for God's kingdom? What does it mean for you and I to follow Jesus today? Amen. <laughs>